What's going on, everyone? My name is Paul. Um, for the past two or so years, I've been working with and, and contributing to an open source project called Briar. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about kind of first what Briar is, a little bit about how Briar works, and then I'm just going to be kind of talking about two things that, that I found with Briar that, that taught me some, some interesting things about computing and that, that I think can be um, like, like uh, tips for how we can build future computing systems. Okay, so kind of the first place to start is just what is Briar? And the like two second elevator pitch is basically that <coughs> Briar is a secure messaging app, kind of like uh, Signal, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, but the kind of twist that, that Briar has that, that kind of differentiates it from a lot of other uh, projects in the space is that Briar is also built to be resilient. So what this means is that when, when you're passing messages with Briar, you actually have the ability to propagate information not only over the internet, but also over the, the kind of local Wi-Fi and also Bluetooth. So kind of what this allows is, is it allows fallback, fallback layers for networking. In, so if you have situations like if you have at and last week, <laughs> um, where you just don't have anything, you can actually have some degree of message passing in some kind of network. With, with the network. Uh, so. <clears throat> oh yeah, and the, these are some screenshots. Um, one other quick thing that I think I should mention is that Briar also has the ability to do like, microblogging kind of like Twitter, um, which is interesting because you can actually pull RSS feeds into Briar and then propagate RSS feeds via uh, this kind of Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi. So uh, to get just into a little technical details about how Briar works in the hood, I think it's like a good place to start is how every other messaging app works. And how, this, how everything is normally set up is you have a client server model. So in this setup, we have Alice and Bob, who are the two people, and they're trying to chat. Um, and how everything works is that there's some, some process or some data structure that's actually being run on some server somewhere. And this kind of has a one-to-one -one mapping to your group chat and your group chat state. So this is important because if you ever want to actually alter your group chat state, you need to somehow be able to make a connection to that server, which is hosted in AWS or whatever uh, provider that, that is actually uh, hosting it. In the so this model works in practice very, very well. People like technology and people in general got really, really good at uh, keeping servers running. So in practice, being we're able to run servers that have 99.9% .9 uptime, and everyone is generally able to send text messages and everything is great. Um, the issues with this is, is that it, this is, first of all, kind of a bad economic model. Like WhatsApp and iMessage and things like this, you're kind of just utilizing someone else's server in order to make all this run. So there's kind of some, some bad economic incentives there. Um, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of things going on. So, uh, so uh, the peer-to-peer -peer model, this is kind of how things work in the higher world. Essentially how it works is there's no longer any server. So the ec economic model is is a bit nicer. And you don't have to deal with, like, basically you're, you're posting and running all of your group chats and, and all of everything kind of on your own devices and on the devices that actually represent the group chat. So this is very nice. You're, now you're, you're kind of off servers and things that you don't need. And the other really, really big advantage that this model compared to the previous model is actually that if you're standing right next to the person that you're texting, how things work right now is the text message will actually go through some kind of network of cell towers and, and servers and routers and things like this. Uh, to the server where your, your chat is hosted and then do a round trip back. So under this model, one really nice advantage that you get is that when you send a message to someone that's physically close to you, uh, the message actually just directly jumps between the messages. So, and one other thing just on this, Briar recently, within the past year, actually developed this, this uh, kind of companion application called the Briar Mailbox. And 
the, the really, really wonderful thing about this is that this kind of gives you a hybrid approach between peer-to-peer -peer and uh, client server model. Basically, what it does is it acts as an always-on server, so when there's an internet connection, you can, you can kind of have all the nice features of this, this kind of uh, client server model where you don't have to constantly be running your device, which is actually, just quickly going back to this, one of the, the massive, massive usability disadvantages with this model is that in order for actual messages to be sent, both devices have to be online at the same time. So if one of these peers or both of them are offline, messages can't be propagated and, and the system doesn't work. So having uptime and having connectivity in this model is, is very, very important. And running a peer-to-peer, -peer, running an entire server is a very battery intensive process. So you have to have good uptime, but then also you, you running this process just absolutely crushes your pain. So that's, that's kind of a lot of this reasoning that, that Briar built this mailbox application to actually allow users to have a server to offload a lot of that every time. But again, the really brilliant thing is that now you have this client server model when the internet's up and things are happy, but then if there's a natural disaster, if the AT&T does whatever they did, um, you can basically fall back to this, this original architecture. Okay. So that's just a quick kind of technical overview of Briar. Um, and now I just kind of wanted to talk quickly about two things that I found out that I learned about the computing in general, uh, kind of joining this project and working with. So the first bit is this notion of ambient where programming or networking. Uh, and basically the, the high level like idea of what this even means is this, this idea that you have computing processes that are actually kind of moving through physical space and aware of physical space. So I, these are, I think, a drawing of cells. I really hope you're uh, drawing of cells. <laughs> you know by They look great. They're yeah, great. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so cells are, are something that in computing people take advantage of, or, or not take advantage of, but they, they use a lot as a metaphor. Uh, for, that, and this has been going on forever since like, Alan Kay in the 70s or 80s or whatever, when small talk and object oriented programming and things like this. Um, but what kind of bothered me with a lot of this is that they, they talk about kind of uh, message passing and all of this stuff, but computers themselves actually have very weak capabilities of actually sensing the physical environment around them. So, like, to, to just like, quickly talk about this, if you take like two modern devices and kind of just put them next to each other, they often have the hardware capabilities of actually directly connecting and talking with each other, but it's actually incredibly annoying to program like a peer-to-peer -peer connection between two devices or Bluetooth and peer -peer Wi-Fi and stuff like this. And actually, there are no current ways of doing peer-to-peer Wi-Fi in an open source way between Apple and Mio and Android devices. So there's like also like weird anti-competitive stuff going on here, um, kind of blocking a lot of this, this networking capabilities. Uh, so, so yeah, the trying to think. Briar is one of the few projects that kind of has writing programs that actually kind of deal with internet networking, but then also this ability of running a process that, that interacts with internet services. And this is some Lisp code. It's I kind of added it as a jump scare, but um, it's uh, <laughs> Briar is not coding in Lisp or anything. It's I just kind of wanted to get across this idea of having generic functions that can then be dispatched based on if you're, you're connecting on Bluetooth or if you're connecting on a Tor, which is how Briar makes all these peer-to-peer -peer kind of internet packages. Okay. And I actually don't, I didn't start uh, on my thing. If any, does anyone know how I'm doing today? It's like 6.54. We might have a few minutes. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Four minutes? Oh, go ahead. Okay, so the second really uh, interesting thing that, um, that, that I kind of learned, like working with Briar and, and kind of being in this what we call local first software community, um, is this, this kind of uh, vision or, or kind of sketch for computing systems that are actually built around this idea of local first data synchronization, which is how kind of Briar under the hood actually handles message passing and things like this. Um, 
And, and just to, to really briefly just kind of go over what any of this even means, what local first data sync and all of this kind of tangibly means, a good working model for it is imagining, like, instead of having, like, the Hack Greenville Slack channel, where we have clients and we're kind of accessing some central server that's somewhere that's hosting the entire Hack Greenville Slack. The, the kind of vision that a lot of people in this kind of greater open source community are having towards towards groupware and, and uh, most kind of personal computing applications is this idea of having the Hack Greenville uh, community hosted as like, a folder that's on your device that's all local data, but what's happening is as you kind of read and write from it, it's doing some underlying network to actually like magically uh, uh, synchronize and publish this information to everyone else that's in there. So you basically have this, this local file that for all intents and purposes it seems like a like a local file system, but it has like permissions that are set by the admins and not necessarily your host operating system. Uh, and and the, as you read and write from it, the, the underlying network can basically publish it um, and, and handles everything under it. So working from this model, I the, this this kind of greater kind of vision for software is this idea that that groupware can be uh, more community garden oriented rather than than maybe arguably what we have now in a lot of cases where you just have like like uh, maybe corporate farms or something like this. This is it. Just, just bear with me with this. Um, and, and basically the the my thinking with all of this is that when we're using something like Slack. We're getting basically some kind of corporate uh, produce or something like this. It's very well polished, it's very well optimized, and it's a very incredibly efficient like, pipeline that actually produces this product. But instead, if you if you can think about software more, again going back to this file system uh, analogy, you can think about building a system out of this this kind of building block. You can actually envision some kind of future system which is a lot more malleable and extendable. Uh, because you can think about it, all the things that you can do with files and file system, you can potentially do with, with this kind of uh, way of model and way of thinking about it. So just I, I put together this kind of diagram. The the kind of vision with this is that you can actually have context-dependent computer graphics that are basically pulling from these, these file systems. And the really brilliant thing with this, again, this like local first data sync, uh, data, data sync approach is that you have full access to all of your local data. You don't have to do any API keys. You don't have to worry about rate limiting and things like this. You can kind of pull the data however you want as if it's kind of local data on your device. Because for all intents and purposes, as long as the abstraction is set which there, it's a big asterisk, but um, things uh, you, can, you can kind of uh, utilize this data in whatever way you please. And the interesting thing that, that kind of comes out of this naturally is that you can actually have a bunch of different repositories that are all these different kind of groups or uh, sync contexts. And you can actually combine them together and make uh, computer graphics that are actually kind of uh, uh, pulling from a bunch of different repos. So in this way, you can kind of build something that's potentially uh, more interesting and, and not as, as kind of siloed as our current way of thinking about computing, where you have one of your separate applications. Instead, with this model, you could potentially build front ends for things that actually pull from your like calendar application, which is synced across all of your your personal devices. You can it could that could sync with some like work calendar or some work like to do list and things like this. And you can actually build. Uh, kind of views that are composed together by queries against a bunch of these different tools. So that's a lot of info to just kind of throw. But um, that's, these are kind of the, the, the things that I've learned with Primer so far. Um, the Kind of the main reason that I'm even doing this talk is that I've been working with Joey from Synergy Mill. Um, and we're actually putting together a kind of meetup, a local meetup based around uh, kind of exploring a lot of these ideas, and we've also kind of built a physical-based computer, which is this kind of, uh, um, or we're in the process, it's not done yet. But uh, the, the vision with this is, is having some kind of interface to kind of data systems and stuff like this, 
uh, where you can actually manipulate it using uh, physical blocks and things like this to track the art and YouTube and, and, and camera tracking and that crazy stuff. Um, so yeah, so that's going to be called Alt Computing, so keep an eye for that on the video. And uh, also, I'm just Paul on the Hack Greenville side, so if you have any questions or anything, you can please